On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we examine the evolution of the container ship from the ideal X to ever forward and ever given. I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. So container ships have been in the news nonstop for quite a while now. We're looking at Ever Forward grounded in Chesapeake Bay, and we just had the anniversary of Ever Given going ashore in the Suez and then being freed a year ago. And so I thought I'd take, a, take some time here and break down this evolution of this type of vessel, the container ship, because we rely so much on the container ship to deliver our goods and ensure a global supply chain that we take for granted how this vessel has really been introduced in a very short period of time, but more importantly, has undertaken a metamorphosis over its years of operation into the behemoths that we see sailing the world's oceans today. So before we jump in, if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Let's go ahead and jump right into our discussion. So the person who revolutionized ocean shipping had nothing to do with ocean shipping. He was a truck driver from Maxton, North Carolina, by the name of Malcolm McLean. McLean owned the seventh largest trucking firm in America. But way back in 1937, while taking a load of cotton up to New York, he got stuck waiting at a terminal to offload the cotton in the back of his truck. And it was while sitting in one of those lines waiting to offload his, his cargo that he started to develop the concept that we know today as containerization. It's got me wondering if there's some truck driver today waiting outside the ports of LA and Long Beach or Charleston, Savannah, New York, New Jersey, who's coming up with the next idea. His idea finally was put into existence in 1956. On April 26, the SS Ideal X, a tanker, sailed from the port of Newark down to Houston, Texas. Now, usually Ideal X carried fuel oil from Houston to Newark and returned empty. But this time she was fitted with what's called mechano decking. This was a type of decking that was superimposed above the fuel system on the main deck. It was used a lot in World War II to transport aircraft and heavy cargo on board tankers. McLean uses it to stow 58 35 foot containers. And the concept of the container was this, you could load it at a origination point, you can seal it, and then never again have to open it until it arrived at its destination. More importantly, that cargo didn't have to be touched physically by longshoremen or anyone. You can seal that container and it's good to go. The idea was you pick it up at your point of origin by road or rail, bring it to a ship, load it on, and then do the opposite when it arrived at its destination. McLean estimated that this lowered the transportation cost for a ton of goods from $5.83 all the way down to 16 cents a ton. And the SSI DLX became the forerunner for the modern container ship today. The first generation of container ships were modified much like SSI DLX. They were either standard cargo ships, freighters, C2, C3 freighters, or tankers. And Malcolm McLean tried to sell the concept of the container, but really met a lot of opposition. If you really want the best book on this, Mark Levinson's The Box is the one I would read. McLean had to come up with a way to sell this. He ran into opposition from longshoremen and stevedores who saw containerization as taking away from their jobs. There was also less thievery and pilfering on the piers, which meant that longshoremen stevedores couldn't get cargo that they usually would be able to dip into and sell. And most importantly of all, there was a huge upfront cost for containerization. You needed boxes, you needed containers, you needed not just one containers, but multiple containers. In some cases, as the ships got larger, you needed ship to shore cranes in the facilities, you needed chassis, you needed trucks, you needed a lay down area. So there's a huge, massive upfront cost for containerization. But where McLean sold the idea of containerization was to the US military in the Vietnam War. In November of 1965, there were over 100 ships waiting to offload in Saigon. And the military was looking for a solution to clear the backlog. And that's where McLean and the staff at Sealand went presented to the Army Material Command their concept of containerization. And with 11 ships, they were able to clear the backlog 
out of Vietnam. And once he was able to prove the concept, that's all it took to implement containerization commercially. Many of the early container ships were modified. And over time, there was realization that certain features had to be lost from cargo ships to carry more containers. The traditional freighters, for example, would lose their cargo gear. The traditional freighters' hull shapes really weren't ideal for putting containers in the interior. So purpose-built first-generation container ships were constructed to speed up the loading and offload. Cell guides were put into the containers to ease the movement of the containers deep into the holds of the vessel and back out. And over time, from the period of the Vietnam War up until the 1980s, container ships grew in size until you reach the Maersk L-Class. And the L-Class are really unique because they're the first vessels we see that hit the limits of the Panama Canal, what we've come to be known as Panamax. The Panamax are constrained by the width, the length, and the depth of the Panama Canal. Now, that was modified a bit in the 1980s to get a new size. Uh, they were able to accommodate larger vessels into the canal. They basically lowered the tolerances. So you get what's called Panamax Max vessels. But the L-Class were revolutionary because we saw for the first time these container ships pushing the limits, a vessel capable of carrying over 3,400 containers. I should note that the L-Class were retired about 20 years ago, purchased by the US government and converted into cargo ships for the US. And the, the first of those vessels just recently got towed away from Norfolk to be scrapped, a vessel that was now known as the US NS Sugheart. Ironically, the second vessel in that L-Class, the Yana, was scheduled to be towed away. However, it's not going to be towed away because the tug is going to have to head up to help with Ever Forward. As container ships continued to develop in the 1980s and more and more cargo shifted over to containerization, there was a realization that if you could increase the size of the vessels, the length, the width, the depth, more importantly, the number of containers carried, you achieve what's called an economy of scale. The, the more containers on a single ship, the less the transportation costs. However, the biggest constraint had been the Panama Canal. But in 1988, American President's Lines introduced the C-10. The C-10, which were built overseas in Europe, were unique in that they were larger than the Panama Canal could accommodate. With ships now larger than the Panama Canal, we reached a new level of size, what was called post-Panamax. The initial C-10s could carry a cargo of roughly around 4,500 containers. But over time, the size of the post-Panamax vessels began to grow. In the early 1990s, Maersk introduced the Sovereign class. The Sovereign class were able to carry 8,000 containers, which at the time was the largest possible for a container ship. But one of the things that Maersk would continue to do is push the limits of vessel size and dimensions. In 2006, Maersk introduced the E-Class with the Emma Maersk. This vessel pushed the limits far beyond what we'd seen. The E-Class initially was rated to carry 11,000 containers, but over time that number was increased as more containers were able to be stacked on deck until the E-Class could handle 14,500 containers. These vessels well exceeded the dimensions of the Panama Canal. Then in 2013, Maersk took the next step with the introduction of the triple E's. The triple E's by Maris could carry 18,000 containers, the very first of the ultra large container ships. The original E class were identified as very large container ships, whereas the triple E's held the category of ultra large container ships. And Maersk went on a huge promotional campaign for the Maersk triple E. Series were developed with Discovery Channel on the construction and operation of the Maersk Triple E's, and even in conjunction with Lego, a Maersk container ship Lego was introduced to the world.
as these ships grew in size, both the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal came to a realization that these vessels, the new ultra-large container ships, were too large even for the Suez Canal. So in the early 2000s, both canals undertook a series of expansions. The most extensive was adding a new lane to the Panama Canal to create a new category known as Neo Panamax. These Neo Panamax vessels no longer were constrained by the twin lanes of the Panama Canal to a ship that could carry roughly about 4,500 containers. But this new dimension, when the canal opened in June of 2016, could now carry up to 12,500 containers as they could push the limits of the new sets of locks. Unfortunately, the design for the Panama Canal had started in the early 2000s, and they didn't appreciate the size of the growth of the new versions of container ships. And therefore, they had to come up with these new standards in case of the Neo Panamax. The Suez Canal similarly undertook a massive expansion in 2015, were open to be able to accommodate ships like the Triple E's and the very large container ships, but that didn't stop the growth of the container ship. In 2020, the introduction of Ever Ace, the largest vessel, these mega container ships, which actually push the size of the ultra large container ships, Mega Max with 24 bays, 24 across, over 24,000 boxes, have reached the upper scale that we've seen in the creation of these container ships today. The other element that goes with the growth of the container ships has been the consolidation of the container lines. I did a separate video on this, which I'll have in the show notes and link to here for you. But one of the things that we've seen happening starting really since 2015 has been the merging of the large container vessels and the operating lines into three massive alliances. Over time, smaller container companies fall by the wayside, and these larger companies like Maersk and Mediterranean Shipping in the 2M alliance, uh, HMM, Hapog Lloyd, the ONE, and Yang Min in the alliance, and then finally the Ocean Alliance, CMA, CGM, the Chinese Overseas Shipping Corporation, along with OOCL, and then Evergreen, all form into these massive alliances. And consolidation with nine companies controlling nearly 85% of the world's containers follows hand in hand with the growth of the size of container ships. In 1956, when SSI DLX sailed from Newark for, from Houston, she carried on board 58 containers. Today, ships like the Ever Forward are 1,096 feet in length, 159 feet wide, and they draw nearly 50 feet of water, can carry over 12,000 containers. The Ever Ace can carry nearly 24,000 containers. Ever Given in the Suez, over 1,300 feet in length, 192 feet wide, carrying 20,000 containers. Container ships over the past 70 years have seen this massive growth and there's really no telling where it will stop. This evolution is one of the most amazing things in terms of ocean tonnage and shipping that we've ever seen. It's become more economical to construct and manufacture goods overseas and ship them to another country because the transportation cost diminishes. Think about the transportation cost to move goods across 58 containers versus being able to move them across 24,000 containers. At the end of World War II, the total amount of cargo moved on the world's oceans was about a half a billion tons. Today, it's nearly 12 billion tons. And containerization plays a vital role in that. We've seen these vessels getting bigger, larger, wider, carrying more cargo. We've seen consolidation, not just in the shipping lines, but in the companies, in the ports. 
where fewer ports can handle those ships. And why is it a ship like Ever Forward is grounded in the Chesapeake? She's one of those Neo Panamaks. She's able to use that new lane of the Panama Canal and bring cargo directly from Asia via the Panama Canal to the East Coast. She doesn't have to offload in LA Long Beach and road and rail it across the country. The ultra large container ships, ships like Ever Ace or Ever Given, don't call it the United States. They're actually too big. US ports can't handle vessels those size. Vessels that size are almost exclusively on the Europe, Middle East, Asia run. We don't see them there. And matter of fact, there are a lot of debates about whether or not you would want ultra large container vessels coming into US ports because of the amount of cargo it would dump at any one time. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it gave you a little bit of an information on the evolution of the container ship. If you did, please subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. When they come out, leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, become a patron. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.